And hi everyone, I'm Ian, and today we're going to talk about actionable from intelligence. And why am I here? I am supposedly a hacker, at least to, according to the ticker below my, my beautifully shaved head. Uh, I work uh, for Zero Fox, where I have the best title ever of Vice President, period. Which means I, I still do whatever I want to do and I'm not pegged into a uh, specific thing. Oh my god, I know! It's so awesome, right? <laughs> I usually get the compliments later, but... Uh, <laughs> um, in my history, I used to have hair and uh, do security from a very young age. This is from my uh, army days back at the IDF in Israel where I had various different stupid roles. And I'm, not, I'm not really the type that works well in a rigid environment. And I don't know why. So I ended up like getting bounced around a lot of places. And, but it's great, exposure experience. And the latest stuff that I did there, or still do there, is uh, run the red team on the Israeli Air Force Cyber Command. Start, run, whatever you want to call it. And uh, I've been a red teamer for, for a long time. I mean, experience wise, I, I'm now at a stage that I'm saying I have over 15 years of experience, <laughs> which is horrible. And, and most of it was from the offensive side, from the red team side. So you're probably asking yourself, what the fuck is this guy doing here in the, the blue team room? Well, most of the red team work is geared so that we can actually fix stuff on the blue team side. And if, if you're a red teamer and you're not doing that, fire yourself, right? Before I do, if, if by, by any chance you become, um, I become a client. Uh, but in, through my years of experience, I've learned that in order to implement proper blue team processes, you need to do things right, and there's no magic silver bullet. And, and that becomes really, really apparent when you start talking about threat intelligence. The new cyber thing. You know, we've gone, we've gone through cloud and big data and, and APT and uh, NG, whatever. NG works for everything, right? New generation of this, new generation of that. So the latest thing, at least as of last uh, RSA, is threat intelligence. And you can buy threat intelligence like a box or a feed or something that costs a lot of money and makes you feel good because you spent a lot of money on the newest buzz thing. And the thing is, you can't just buy threat intelligence. Mm. And like everything else in the blue team, you need to have proper structure and understanding of what is the context. The context for any blue team work, especially for threat intelligence, is a threat model. Okay. A threat model is one of the truly magical things that enable, enable us as defenders to say, I don't care about that. Right? Repeat after me. I don't care about that. These are the magic words that a defender, that a CISO, that a risk manager, that a CEO needs to be able to say when faced with something that he doesn't really care about. Right? I am not Cisco. Right? I don't care about Cisco's threats. I am not target. I don't care about target's threats. All right? I have a different kind of business. And you're, you can only do that by having a proper threat model. Let's spend a few minutes talking about threat models before we move on to threat intelligence because otherwise you'll be like lost and out to the top of the can. So what, how did you build up on threat intelligence if you don't have a threat model? So a few schools of threat modeling exist. Is this too, too loud? Or it's just, no. okay, no. <laughs> because I'm sitting under the speaker. Great. Okay, just making sure. Uh, three main schools of threat modeling, attacker-centric, asset-centric, and, um, and software-centric. Almost forgot. That shit works. That's awesome. <laughs> um, so, three main schools. We'll talk briefly about them. First of all, attacker-centric is where you focus on your threats, your actual threat actors. And you start with them by identifying who is out there to get me. All right? That's usually the questions that you should ask your CEO, COO, the people who actually run the business, 
Don't ask the IT guys. Don't ask even not the CISO, if he's one of those technical CISOs that only cares about building firewalls and spending money with, with whoever it is, kicking the IBM. Uh, ask the people who actually run the business and face the business problems. What keeps you up at night? Right? What kind of threat are you, you know, this is how are you gonna get in jail? Right? Under what circumstances? And from that, kind of build on, so I have those threat actors and that's how they affect me, blah 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 blah. Software centric. Uh, this, these are probably the models that you've heard most about, especially if you came from R&D or a very software technical centric practice. Uh, you'll probably remember words like Dread and Stride and all those fancy software threat modeling tools. They're great if you're in R&D. They're almost useless if you're running a business and especially if you're trying to figure out threat intelligence because software as much as we'd like to uh, um, make it very glamorous and this is this is everything that we care about, it's not, all right? It's it's really not. It's just software. Uh, so let's put that aside and, and, and let R and D deal with that. The last one is asset centric, which is kind of the, the flip side of of threat centric threat modeling. You start with the assets, all right, and with the the flip side questions to the CEO, COO, CFO are how do we make money? Okay, how am I getting paid? How are you getting paid? Where are all those stock options coming in from? All right, what is the business? What does the business do or the organization do? Okay. What what do I need to protect? And when I say assets, again, don't don't fall into that pitfall of the IT guy is going to tell you, oh, we have those assets, and they're like routers and firewalls and servers and workstations. Like, no, these are not assets in a business perspective. These are technical supplements to support stuff that you do with the assets to make money with the business. Okay, so don't confuse those two different things. Assets in a threat model is something that's less tangible, all right, than a server or a database. So let's focus on the two, uh, the two threat modeling schools that are basically asset-centric and attacker-centric and start, start working from there because that's, that's where really uh, the, where threat intelligence can really come into play in terms of showing value and helping you as a defender get better all right? and minimize the risk, minimize the, the threat. Uh, some of the uh, practical tools that I like using and that I know of uh, are Octave, and, and it's kind of a little sister Octave S for smaller businesses. Uh, it's great threat modeling and, and risk modeling tools, as well as FAIR, F-A-I-R, Factor Analysis of Information Risk. Um, I'm sure that there are others out there. Find one that you are comfortable with. Find one that your customers might be using. All right, and learn how to use that language. Learn how to use that threat modeling language and capabilities in order to map out what is it that you're, you're actually defending. And that by itself is an interesting practice because a lot of companies don't have that. And, and the end of the day, they're like, so why, why did I have all those controls over here where I'm not actually effective? So let's talk a little bit about the, the threat actors. What, how do I, what, what do I do with them in the threat model? Uh, because that's where I'm going to derive or, or target most of my threat intelligence is to identify how are my threat actors affecting me and how can I prepare to defend from them. So threat actors could be everything from you know crazy Russian hackers to, to Chinese hackers to <coughs> internal threats like your CEO or, uh, or your vendors or whatever it is. You have to identify that. Again, talk to the people who actually run the business and identify who are those groups. We call them either threat communities or threat actors if they're a little more specific. Who are those communities or actors that you as you know, a person who runs a business on something uh, are afraid of? Right? Who has been known to attack us, to approach us? And when you do that, you're going to start mapping out basic elements of those threat actors, right? Who are they? What are their capabilities? 
from a technology perspective, from an accessibility perspective? What's their motivation to go after us? Okay? That should all go into the threat model. The, the next thing that you want to start factoring in, as I said, are the assets. So you map out your attackers, your potential threats. Now figure out what am I protecting. And again, map it out. Create a model that you can update on an ongoing basis that reflects how the business operates. Because obviously that's going to be a live, living document. Right? The business does not stagnate on its asset. You keep changing, you invent new products, you invest in R&D, you do M&As, you hedge, you know, you bet on money through a certain algorithm, and that's like the big thing. Whatever it is you do, it keeps changing, and that's that's why the business makes money. So map those assets. As I said before, assets not necessarily a server or a database. And map the supporting elements around them. That's where the technology kicks in. That's where the controls kick in. All right. So I might have an asset that's stored inside a database. That database is protected by a firewall, an AV, this and that. It might be protected also by a process of validating input and output that might not be technology. There might be some old lady going, oh, this is wrong. You know, part of the transaction, part of the process, let's say a financial transaction, might not be a technology element, might be, again, an old lady saying, yeah, nah, that's not an approved vendor. It's not on my like handwritten list. That's an awesome control. We call that a mitigating control in risk language. And you know what? It fucking works. So I don't need your fancy technology if I have a mitigating control to reduce the risk of making transactions with vendors. Okay? Because I have Lucy. She's been doing this for 30 years. Cool. And I just saved you money on, on putting controls on vendor transactions. So now that we have a threat model, again, you have your threat actors, communities, you have your assets mapped out, processes around them, people that are involved with the process that change the assets, the controls that you have uh, to mitigate uh, any kind of risk to the assets. You have your, again, attackers, their, their capabilities, the technologies that you use, everything is fine. Then you can start enriching that model with threat intelligence. Threat intelligence is basically the stuff that makes that threat model live from the non-asset element. All right, so we said we know how to how to keep the asset elements alive because we're running the business. All right, we're inside. We can know if an asset changes or if a control changes. Threat intelligence comes in into play on the threat actor side to tell us more about how do they affect or potentially affect our assets. So before we talk about threat intelligence, we need to talk about a collection, right? Threat collection or intelligence collection. How do I collect intelligence or data and turn it into intelligence? And what do I focus on? So the answers are very simple. First of all, just by saying no to some of the stuff, we can kind of clear out of the way. And threat intelligence or threat data is not MD5s. It's not hashes of malware. It's not IP addresses or URLs or whatever the fuck the, the threat intel vendors are hawking in mass. All right? You should be saying, why isn't that already a feed into my firewall, URL filter, AV, whatever other controls do I have? Why do I need to buy an extra feed of signatures and give it to my signature engine? All right, that is not threat intelligence. The second question is, why is that relevant, or how is that relevant to me, to my business, to my threat model? Okay, so that is not threat intelligence. That's just signatures. Put that aside, have someone else deal with that, and get it for free. Don't pay for that. Sorry, vendors. And let's talk about what do I collect. So first of all, again, go back to the threat model. Look at your threat actors. Focus on them. If your threat actor is China and like the PLA, well, first of all, you have a problem. <laughs> um, but that's what you should be focusing on in terms of understanding how do I enrich my understanding of what they can do, how they do it, what's their accessibility, who do they hire, what's, what, what are their, their tools, and so on and so forth. If my threat actor is a competitor, 
Okay? That's something different. I start collecting intelligence on my competitor. Talk to your business intelligence guys. All right? How do they operate? How much do they sell? To who? Who are their suppliers, their partners? Who do they use in order to get advanced, uh, get ahead sort of the competition? All right? That's my threat actor. I should worry about that. And so on and so forth. The second element is industry. All right? I am not a spe I mean, I have a special snowflake in my industry, but there are many others like me, just a little different, hopefully. Um, we are all, as an industry, whatever that industry is, probably experiencing some similarities in terms of who's after us. Right? If I'm in the oil and gas industry, Probably, you know, there are a few companies in the oil and gas industry that experience the same kind of threat actors going after them. Right? Greenpeace could be one of them. Uh, the UAE could be another one of them. Whoever it is, we're experiencing similar attacks. So look at the industry and say, huh, my competitor got attacked, or my partner, whatever it is, what can I learn from that? Because I might be the next one. Okay, so we're broadening up a little bit the, in, in, as far as the spectrum goes of what do I collect and where do I look for and, and look for those. And last but not least, we're getting into the MP5 kind of uh, uh, low cap thing, the more general threat intelligence, all right? Understanding that I have people in my organization that work for me. People are usually the main ah, security problem, right? And, and people get affected by the more general stuff. If, if there's a you know a Final Four or the playoffs in the NBA or any kind of big event going on, a lot of the, the kind of random casual threat actors that I've met before are going to go after a lot of people en masse, trying to target or fish or get them to to click on the what, what's the the fantasy sport thing for people who don't do sports and the fantasy football things and. Yeah, so there's a lot of fishing going around there. There's, you know, big names are involved now. There's a lot of scams, obviously. That can affect my employees, all right, because they're Americans and they're not football and they're all like, you know, I know. I mean, half of my email and my corporate email it has a filter on it now that just goes to don't care. And I'm sure that other, other people do care and click on every fucking link in there. So that's, again, that's kind of general threat intel. In terms of characteristics, that's usually more in, in periodical. Again, sports things and, and like big events and, and debates and elections and, and world news, whatever that is. That, by the way, you can usually get from those threat intel vendors, okay? Because they're much more generic and they don't necessarily apply to you as an industry or as a business. Next question, because every everything so far has been get data, get intelligence. So this is how. And first of all, OSINT. A lot of stuff you can get for free. All right? There are a lot of resources that can, very, can get very specific to your industry that you can get for free. Okay? I'm not going to do a whole talk about OSINT. There are you know, a lot of practices out there. A lot of blogs popping out now by a lot of my, my friends and colleagues about OSINT practices and, and really getting down and uh, down and to, to the practice itself. I've gathered a few links here, uh, a few of the, oh, my favorite OSINT, OSINT links, some PDFs, some, some links to websites that explain how to do that. Basically what you're looking at is the ability to zero down on a geography, on a language, on an industry, and get as much news or as much information from forums, from blogs, whatever it is, for that specific area. All right, and that area may cover your industry. That area may cover your threat actors and communities, and that's where you want to start getting that data to turn it into into intelligence. And look for pitfalls when you when you look for very specific threat actor stuff. And that's where you usually have to involve humans, as we call it in the, the intelligence community, which is human intelligence. A lot of the, the data sources will require someone to log into a forum, 
All right, some of those forms are not just public and searchable. You have to be a member. Sometimes you have to be vetted. In order to be vetted, you have to be active in the whatever that forum is doing. Okay, and it gets very tricky to collect intelligence from those. You can't just go like Google hacking and give me everything from that forum. It's not going to work. It's you know the deep web, dark web, whatever it is. And you will need human actors getting involved in collecting that intelligence. Again, depending on your threat intelligence practice, you either want to do that in-house or, again, find someone who specializes after you've identified these are my threat actors, specializes in those threat actors and have that human capabilities that speak Chinese, Russian, Ukrainian, Portuguese, whatever it is, that can actually interact and get intelligence from those forms. So, uh, again, feel free to, to check out the link. I promise there's no malware there unless someone broke into my website and uh, completely destroyed it. Um, remember that you will get a lot of unstructured data. Again, we're not talking hashes and IP addresses and URLs. You're talking about freeform data. Uh, it can have keywords, it can have IP addresses, it can have whatever. So start looking at tools that are good with processing freeform data. Splunk is your best friend in those cases. Some Python hacking to just look for keywords and correlate data between different sources. And before you, again, before you buy into some threat Intel platform, try to, try to see if you can do it by yourself. It's gonna be easier, cheaper, and usually more effective because it's for you, all right? It's not for everyone, it's for you. And finally, we're getting to threat intelligence. So we've spent almost 20 minutes talking about threat, getting to threat intelligence, we're getting there. And so turning that data that you've collected all right, into intelligence is by itself a, a practice. All right? The process of turning data into intelligence is basically putting context around it, and it's your context. All right? That's where the whole 15 minutes of threat modeling and threat actors and assets come into play. All right? Data that is, does not fit into your context, irrelevant, or at least not immediately relevant for you. It's not real threat intelligence. And so let's see how others define actual threat intelligence. And I've stolen this courtesy of the 451 research and with permission. Okay, you know. and so that's how they define kind of the, the threat intel pyramid from data, which is just data. All right? And you have to decide, what do I use with that? How do I use that? Don't use it. And Providing data that, that, or analysis of data. Again, that's, that's where a vendor comes in and say, all right, that data means ABC. But again, it's usually in the generic context, not necessarily for you. If you find it useful, great. If you don't, screw it. And the top of the pyramid is basically providing contextual data to your environment. And that's what we're looking for. This is a real threat into practice where you can say, this is relevant for me. All right? And that's where it becomes actionable because generic kind of lolcats and MD5s, eh, the, the, the URL filter is going to block that kind of issue. It's not targeting me. All right? It's targeting everyone. And that one is, is the one that we're trying to get to. And, and that leads us to a problem because this is the, the adoption of threat intelligence, at least according to uh, surveys, which are, again, biased a little bit. Because or why our research comes in, it's like, how are you using threat intelligence? Oh, of course I'm using threat intelligence. Have you seen those Jimmy Kimmel uh, kind of street interviews? Yeah, so it's kind of like that. Uh, how do you think the debate was the day before the debate? Oh, I think that Hillary was this, this, and like, oh, really? <laughs> so surveys, again, take it with a pinch of salt. Um, there, we're not seeing huge adoption. And the reason is that we're not really getting to that top of the pyramid where it becomes actionable, and I can say, I've actually used this. I've managed to reduce my risk from point A to point B using threat intelligence. How many times have you heard a CISO or a threat intelligence customer say that on their TI vendor? Apparently not so much. And this is why I became angry and ranty and drunk with friends and came up with this talk. So that's kind of that. <laughs> Mostly, 
almost all my talks start with like, oh, this is awful. <laughs> Why don't people do it better? Okay, I'll tell them how. Um, so we know what we know, what we want, and what we don't want. Uh, let's focus on what can we do with that. All right. So how do I use that thread intel, which is still kind of fuzzy in terms of the data that I collected that's relevant for my context based on my thread actors and assets, how do I turn it into something actionable, all right? So as a classic like military trained person, we divide it into three parts. <laughs> preemptive, reactive, and ongoing. So preemptive, I know shit's gonna burn, okay? It's not burning yet, but I know something's gonna burn. And this is like the holy grail of threat intelligence. This is the da -da 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 incoming, it's not hitting us yet, but I know it's it's gonna hit us. Alright? And I know where, and I know where it's gonna hurt, and I know where it's coming from. Okay? And the characteristics of that kind of threat intel is that it has a very, very well defined start date. It's like it's coming, it's gonna hit in ten minutes, three days, whatever it is. And a fairly well-defined end date, all right? Because it's a singular attack. It's not like a, a tsunami of attacks that are just endless. And it's, it's, again, very specific. It's usually very, very contextual to me as a defender and to my threat communities. And a good general examples of things that I know I need to protect from are things like I mentioned before, again, big media events. Right? I know that if I'm if RSA is coming up in what is now February or something like that, I'm sending a lot of my executives to one big location in San Francisco or again Black Hat is a good example. I'm sending tons of executives to Black Hat and so I know I'm gonna get a lot of phishing before that with all the party invites. Okay? And I know I'm gonna get a lot of Connections, friend connections on and requests on LinkedIn because everyone's like handing cards like here you throw this you throw this you throw this and eventually they connect on LinkedIn. So as an attacker, right? And again, this is what I do. I've been there. This is a classic time to craft a very very specific spear phishing attack for everyone who went to Black Hat. And so again, I have a designated time. I know that stuff's going to happen. I can start putting up walls. The walls could be, hey, Mr. Executive, you're going to Vegas. It's not all going to be fun and games. If it's your first black hat, or whatever it is, here's what to expect. Here's what to look out for. All right? It can start with that. It can end with, here's Mr. Executive, your new phone. Use that in Vegas. All right? This is a special phone. <laughs> Don't bring your iPhone or whatever it is. It connects you to work. It can do whatever you do. Usually, it's just a little more secure. And it's 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 fine for that one-time event as long as you keep you know fulfilling your, your basic needs of my fine porn. And so again, it's it's taking actions to preempt an attack like that. The second category is reactive. Boom, shit happened, now we gotta deal with it. Alright? Good examples, I'm drawing it all day. Guess what's gonna happen? Alright? Every, everyone's freaking out. Super free, shell shock, heart bleed. All those fun stuff are reactive threat intelligence. Now I need to deal with that. All right? Characteristics, very well defined start date. It happened like five minutes ago, three days ago. People started patching, blocking shit. And it's got like a long and long tail of someone still scanning for hard bleed, <laughs> someone still looking for shell shock. And on the internet, people like, you know. A lot of my good friends are still scanning and looking for who's patched, who's not patched, who released a new product with an old build that is not patched. And it happens, I know, crazy. People don't care about security anymore. And so again, that's, that's the, the second kind of threat intel and its characteristics that we need to look at and pay attention and feedback to the threat model. The last one is the onboarding. All right, it's your usual kind of generic or, or more general threat communities that are just always out there, always out there to get you, looking for the next opportunity, the, the hackers, all right, anonymous, uh, ISIS is a good example, all right, 
They're not going away anytime soon, unless someone takes a really bold action and just went boom. And that's not going to happen. So these are the kind of ongoing threats that I it sounds like, oh, please, God. <laughs> oh, shit, I forgot I'm in DC, half your feds. <laughs> Talk to me later. I've got some idea. I've, I've had, I have years of experience dealing with that kind of shit. <laughs> um, so these are your ongoing threats that you just need to monitor on a constant basis and tune what you know about them as far as, again, technologies that you're using, common attack vectors, accessibility. Again, ISIS is a great example. They're looking at recruiting. Recruiting is a big thing on social media, on forums. They're, uh, they're looking at specifically English-speaking individuals. And so you know what, what the threat is going to look like. You know where they're, they're going to uh, approach your communities so you can start tuning how you deal with that on, on an ongoing basis. Which leads us to the actionable part. So how do I get all these nicely categorized elements, threat intelligence, and, and all those news feeds, and Oh my God, this is going to happen. What do we do with that now? All right, uh, I know we're, we want to be like this, <laughs> Netflix and whatever. Um, and some solutions make it look like it's going to be like this. Um, and this is probably the only solution that actually delivers. All right, and I know that I'm, I'm a happy customer. Okay, it's it works and. But you really want to turn it into something that's, from an actionability perspective, you want to create some, some form of alert. An alert that's going to say something very specific, all right, in terms of an action. What do I do now, all right, and who do I tell it to do? Is it the viral admin? Is it HR? Is it legal? All right, is it marketing? Do I need to change something? An alert is not necessarily all right, some SIM alert that pops up and says, close that port and firewall. All right, it might be a part of it. A threat intel alert should be a little more involved and should have a little more information in it. And so, first of all, from an alert perspective, we want to get the distance. How far is this event from me? All right, distance can be in time, it's like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, two hours, five days, a year. It can be physical distance, all right? And people are marching down the street. I've dealt with threat intelligence that translated to they are crossing the bridge. And I was like across the bridge, sitting in a knock and going, oh shit. <laughs> and that's threat intelligence. That can actually translate to something physical. And the distance could be logical one, all right? They're five hops away on the intertubes, all right? Someone crank one of those tubes and divert it somewhere, somewhere else, right? So first of all, distance. You want to define that in your alert, in your threat intel alert. And the second one is what we call the TTPs, all right? Tools, techniques, processes, procedures. What are they going to use or what are they using against us, all right? Is it low orbit eye cannon from, from, from uh, the anonymous guys? Is it APT from Ambient? Is it, you know, SQL injection of some sort? Or a very, very, or like an O-Day that, yeah, we're getting dropped an O-Day. Uh, it's important to understand, again, what's the context? How should I react to, and, and the reactions are going to be completely different, right, between all those different examples. That should be the second part of your threat intel alert. Um, last but not least, and that's, the, that's where it gets really tricky. If you get to that question, you know you're doing something right. As a response to the alert, all right, I'm going to take an action. How is that action going to affect my attacker? Okay, we're getting to like World War II Enigma ethical questions. What do I do with that threat intelligence now? That's a real, that's when you know you have threat intel on your hands. When you go, if I stop this attack, they're going to know that I know something about them. And yes, when you get to that point, 
give yourself like two awesome points and, and start thinking about how do you carry on that game on the long run and take some casualties on the short run, you know, show that you can, oh yeah, you got a Linux server, it's like weak and not responding. But so I'll give you a couple of those kind of, you know, pawns, uh, but you're not gonna get to my database. Okay? And still not give out the fact that I knew this was coming. All right? And I've targeted the board, you know what? I shut down the database. Deal with it. For 10 minutes or a day. Whatever I can take in as a business in terms of operations. So that really, that's really the, the last test, the last element of a TI alert is what is the effect from an actionable perspective on my attacker. A couple of examples on what to do uh, or, or on the actionability of a threat intel alert. Uh, one I call just preemptive incident response. And this is a good example that I've actually experienced of, of build, help build a, a threat intel capacity with one of, our, one of my customers, really quickly had to ramp up something and got to a point where we were able to say, we've got an attack coming in in 16 minutes. All right, we know what's the target out of thousands of, of online assets that we had. And for that customer, online assets were assets. Like, they're very public, you have to be out there and show that you're huh, strong, I'm, I'm government, I'm still standing. And out of thousands of online assets, we knew specifically one or two that were gonna be targeted. We knew the TTPs. We had a chance to see the tool and quickly review the source code and see like, oh, <laughs> that's a mistake. Uh, this is, how, this is how it's going to look like. I can actually signature this. Okay? And it's going to be like a big DDoS, whatever it is. And I knew how many participants estimated are going to be involved in that attack. In, in that specific case, it was a DDoS. And I had 16 minutes to prepare for it. What do you do? You start IR right now. You start incident response before the incident and have everyone that's going to be involved in that incident response respond to it and see how well do they do and go through the different layers the different uh, parts of the attack practice it learn what do I need to fix oh this one wasn't ready this one wasn't ready they didn't know about the escalation procedure blah blah blah, blah. and get to a point where when the attack actually happens you just sit back and you go through the same attack as you just practiced it, all right? So a dry run before the wet run is one of the great examples of how do you actually use threat intelligence. Another example, and again, this is a little more advanced. This was kind of basic. We've got an alert. We know what to prepare for. We know what are going to be the targets. So I can kind of strengthen, make sure that these are OK, and, and practice it. Another example of practicing threat intel correctly is counterintelligence. You will get to those points where you build a good enough practice internally that you're able to start manipulating or participating or, or we call it pushing the engagement line further back out of your home field towards the attackers. And that's where it gets, again, interesting, counterintelligence. How do I mess or alter or minimize whatever legally feasible, acceptable word you can find with my attackers to minimize my exposure? Uh, so a good example, again, from, from my past of practicing threat intel and, and putting it to, to good use, I hope, was identifying a forum where my threat community or my customers, whatever, threat community or actors were getting their tools commission, build, whatever it is, and, and see that someone, again, get really involved, human, into that form, and, and get to a point where someone is releasing a new version of, of a tool, of a rat, and knowing that I can, hmm, I can do something with it. And in fact, the tool, with itself, because whoever's downloading this and using it is not going to run it through virus tool, it's not going to run a virus scan on it. It's a fucking virus. <laughs> so of course it's going to be infected with a virus, but it's really infected with itself. 
and it's popping a shell from the attacker back to some random place where I can know that someone is running it. So that's a great indication of who's using that tool, when. They're obviously, again, if you, if you target it narrowly enough, you know that these are bad guys. All right? This is not some random dude going like, ooh, free software. No. <laughs> this is from a specific forum in a specific language used by specific people that I know because, again, I've collected the intelligence and I've, sorry, the data and correlated it to a context that makes it intelligence for me. So that's a great example of getting an alert that says, Ooh, someone just downloaded this. From there on, ask your lawyer. All right, find a good lawyer that will find a way to use this opportunity and to do whatever you want. Again, you'll get into that enigma thing of how do I affect or what? How do I act without alerting my attacker that I know what they're doing, and so on and so forth. Critical. All right, this is not a one-shot game. As I alluded to in the beginning, Threat Intel comes into play to provide a feedback to enrich your threat model. I know it's kind of boring because we're talking threat models and not some fancy metasploit, boop, your own, uh, but that's actually something that we can use and we can show the value in a defensive practice of how you're increasing your resilience and how you're reducing your risk. So the feedback loop is critical. After every event, after every alert, after every step of the way of, of practicing threat intelligence, you need to make sure that you have that feedback loop that you enrich and actually change your threat model. Because that's going to change the way of how you collect intelligence and how you analyze it and how you adapt it back to your specific context. Okay? So make sure that you have that. If you don't have something like this, all right, where you start with threat model, collection, analysis and dissemination, and then alerts and actions, and you don't have those two red lines feeding back your process, you're not doing anything good. I mean, you're just staying at that same point. You're not, you're not getting any better. So the attackers, by definition, are going to get ahead of you, and they're going to hit you, and then someone's going to go like in, why aren't we getting better? I mean, the first couple months were nice, but I think we need to talk about, you know, our relationships, where they're going. And so you need to make sure that that feedback loop exists in order to retain that job of running threat intelligence. And a good way to do that is to, again, get a system of measuring by expected versus observed, all right? This is where your threat intel comes in, all right? I expect something to happen. Right? An attack by X, you know, um, with a knife in the, in the library, but actually it was by Y with a knife in the kitchen. All right? What is that difference? Why did I get that, you know, in a perfect world, everything would be on that diagonal line. All right? Expected and observed would be smack on together, everything's fine. All right? The green and the red are differences between what I expected and what actually happened. Analyze those. Try to understand what makes this gap. All right? What did I do wrong? And it's not really wrong. Or how can I do better next time to minimize this all right? and have the expected closer to what actually is being observed? Again, create the tools and the measures to show that, to show and to analyze that over time. If you're not showing progress in terms of minimizing or getting those clients closer, again, you're not doing it right. So make sure that these processes are in place, that you have the same, the, the language, the metrics, whatever frameworks you want to put around this, measurements in, in place so that you can fix your threat intel practice later on. And so quickly summarizing what, what we went through, so I'm not going to go over time. Where's my phone? We're still waiting. Yeah, I'm good. 44 minutes. I'm right on time. So first of all, cut the fuck, all right? Um, it's tricky. It's very tempting to go to a big conference and see, well, Fred Intel, and they got free stuff, and 
Everyone's speaking in weird languages, and they all seem very professional and nicely dressed, or you know, women everywhere, whatever it is. Cut the fud, talk about how, how do you help me do my job? It's, a, it's not a really hard question. All right? And a lot of people are going to be stumped. I'm like, what do you mean? You provide threat intelligence. You need threat intelligence. I'm like, okay, I'll ask again. How does that help me get my job done? And the second question is, is really, how is that actionable? What do I do with this? All right? If the answer is, oh, you plug it into your firewall or SIM or URL, or like, oh, you mean you're a signature provider that you talk, oh, you know what? Here's the phone, here's the phone number for Checkpoint, and Matthew, talk to them, all right? Give them the signature so that when I use the product, they're good. Now, talk to them again. What do I do with this? If it's not actionable, it's not for intelligence, all right? I don't just want to know about shit going on. Okay, I, I love the example of everyone freaking out after a Dooku 2. Right? We have signatures for Dooku 2. We're the first ones to have signatures for Dooku 2. Do you know who Dooku 2 targets? Anyone? No? It, it's very scary, like it's the second version of Dooku. Dooku 2 targets as first. It targets AV companies. All right? I don't give a shit about that. It's like, great for you to have a signature. I don't need it. All right? if, I'm, if, if me as a small business is concerned about Dooku 2, I have way bigger problems than I think I do. All right? I am not the Russian government. I don't need to deal with the Russian government. And so again, cut, cut the plug, get action, build it yourself. You know, it's not, it's not a really rocket salad, as one of my favorite Twitter friends say. <laughs> um, but you do have to actually do work. And again, I know it's kind of weird in our, our world where everything is metasploitable and clickable and whatever it is, but you have to actually do work. And that's why I spend a lot of time going through building a threat model, enriching it, building a practice of collecting intelligence and analyzing it and using it. Build your own tools. There's lots of free stuff out there. Very, very usable. They made all the shortcuts for you. You just need to kind of assemble it together for your specific situation. All right? A tool that's been sold en masse to, a lot, to everyone in every industry is probably not the perfect fit for you. All right? Unless it's a framework that you can adapt and use for you, don't just buy tools. And when you do, and, and you want to, you've identified an opportunity of, I don't want to do this, and I found a vendor who can, that's where you can start throwing money out. All right? Not at the beginning of, I need the blinky lights to say thread intel. I need a big screen in my sock, not whatever it is, to go pew, pew, pew. No. <laughs> All right? Identify an opportunity to throw money away where you need it. It's like, I don't want to hire more people to do this. These guys do it, and I can get it for, for cheaper. That's where you throw money. It's like business one-on-one. And sorry for, for, for bringing the business keyboard. That's about it. And I think we covered everything. This, if there's anything, any slide that should stay with you from, from this uh, 48 minutes of, of blabbering is this. Is making sure that you've got every one of those boxes checked. Okay? I know a lot of us, especially on the federal side, sorry guys, and love to check boxes. So check all those boxes. <laughs> Make sure they're connected, and, and we should be fine. And I think we have a couple minutes for questions. If you have any, I'll be more than happy to take them. Yes, sir, in the back. You're going to really shout out. So, so the question is, how do I measure the effects of different attackers on different organizations? Or, or I didn't really get the... The model is simple, yes. 
why are we not using models that are simple and that work? <laughs> and it, um, I, I'm trying not to be the jaded, depressing guy <laughs> that says, you know what, talk to Jack Daniel. All right, Jack has got a phenomenal talk. All right, it's called you know, Standing on Shoulders of Wings for St. John's and something like that. Let me, let me give you a hint. Most of the shit we're dealing with now has been solved 30 years ago. Why are we not doing it? I don't know. We keep learning, we keep teaching ourselves. I go, you know, I start, I start working with like college students and going like, they're solving problems that we have, that I've solved as a college student, all right? They're, I'm seeing master's thesis on problems that I've solved and provided code for five years ago. We're not really good at this whole intelligence thing. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't know, I don't have an answer for you. I, I really don't. I, I'm trying to be positive here. And it's not selling, it's practicing. It's practicing, again, it's... And the problem is, I think, a lot of times people are looking for that, who's going to sell me that? All right, it's the easy checkbox approach of, oh, we need thread intel. Who do I buy that thread intel from? I think that's the, the root of the problem. It's, but uh, we, can, we can pick it up for drinks. So. <laughs> Anyone else want to buy any drinks? Yes, you can buy your drinks. Is there a significant impact on threat prevention from an industry best practice? And I think we're slowly getting there. Again, um, this is the optimist team. And we're seeing standards such as PTEPs, which again, I'm jaded and I'm biased because I wrote it, get adopted into PCI. Who would have thought that PCI would have something relevant for security? So we're getting there. You know, we're forcing people to adopt the best practices. I hate the word best practices because they're not best for you, all right? They're best for like John Doe's and everyone else, all right? So that's kind of the, you need to be this high, all right, to ride the InfoSec thing. So that's the best practice. You want to really practice, you gotta be a little, a little better. But again, it, it, it's getting us past the stupid hurdles and so we're not just just completely failing, you know, kind of the, the knights with no hands and, and <laughs> like, yes, yes, I'm still here. So we're, it's getting us out of that box. Uh, unfortunately, again, best practices are, are not, really not best. Yeah? Um, do you think this problem is complicated by the threat intel vendors that you talked about by selling signatures as threat intelligence? And if so, what can they do to help the problem rather than... Great question, and I'm not going to fall for it. The question was, are, are threat intel vendors basically perpetuating the problem? And the answer is actually kind of yes, right? They, we, as a, an industry, have found a new topic to deal with, and as entrepreneurs, myself included, went, oh, I can have a great product in this line of business and kind of patch a little hole there. And, I, and, and yes, they've done that. And they're like, oh, buy my thread intel, buy my thread intel, they're all shit. But recently, I, and I just posted like a link on, on Twitter this morning, you can see them starting to understand that if they're not in your specific context, they're not really relevant. And they're starting to adopt this kind of way of thinking and, uh, and methodology, I want to say, in practice, and saying, you know, this is how we can fit into your threat model. And they're actually saying threat model, and they're saying FAIR, again, which is one of my favorite threat modeling uh, frameworks. And they're saying, this is how we can enrich, very specifically, elements of your threat model. FAIR has like a, a you know, famous tree of how they factor in risk, and they say, this, this and that can be enriched by our threat intelligence. So they're getting there, they're, they're starting to understand, oh shit, remember that four or five run research adoption chart? They're realizing they're not really selling as well as they should have, maybe they should adapt it to 
something more actionable. Wrap it up. All right. Thank right, you Steve, very much, everyone. One second. Yep. Steve, one second. Can you have this? Right. Yes, thank you. Let's have a round of applause.